maybe just another minute or so. We have 35 people, but we sent it out to more than 35 people. I'm showing over 50 on my screen. about good to get started. I'm seeing about 65 people now. Terrific. Uh, so if you would go ahead and mute yourself unless you're speaking. Uh, so good afternoon everyone and welcome. My name is Ginger Robert Scott and I'm the director of the Maine WIC program. Thank you for joining our webinar on relactation. I want to give you a bit of housekeeping before we start. Please keep yourself on mute and use the chat box for questions. Also drop in your location so we know where you're coming from. This session is being recorded and will be put on Maine WIC's YouTube page. Now I'd like to introduce Carrie Louch. She's Maine's breastfeeding and outreach coordinator. When the latest crisis hit an infant formula recall, Carrie had an idea for this relactation webinar as a response to help parents feed their babies. I had the easy part to say, make it so Carrie, and she did, and she made it look easy, as there are a lot of moving parts getting this session together so quickly. So thank you, Carrie, and a big thank you to Sam Blanchard, our nutrition coordinator as well. I couldn't do it without our team. Carrie, over to you. Thanks, Ginger. Uh, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming the person who um, is the brains behind this whole operation as far as the content. Uh, Paula Norcott is the owner of Maine Mother and Company, a perinatal resource center in Brunswick, Maine. She is a lactation consultant, labor and postpartum doula, and childbirth educator with over 22 years of experience serving feeding parents. Paula got her start in this work as a peer counselor for WIC in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1999. She facilitated support groups for the local hospital, completed her CLC training certification there in 2005, and worked as a peer counselor for 10 years. She's currently working in clinical, hospital, and private settings. Paula spent years going deep, 200 plus dietetic hours deep, into feeding issues like tongue ties and how they affect not only feeding but maternal health as well. Frustrated by how maternal pain is brushed off and how slow infant gain is blamed on feeding parents, Paula has made it her mission to help these families feel confident in their plan and ability to feed their tiny humans. Her number one lesson in working with hundreds of families in New England, every family is unique, every case is different, and you never know the answers before having all of the information. Paula is fueled by good coffee, great humor, and human connection. Running her own business has given her hustle and drive. Having five children has made her super flexible and humble. Working with families has shown there isn't one right way to do anything. There's only the right way for that particular family in that particular situation. When not working with new families, Paula can be found scrolling through TikTok, pink drink in hand, learning how to keep houseplants alive. Paula, we'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone. I'm so excited to be here, especially um, with lots of New England people. I'm from the Boston area originally and my accent slips out all the time. So those of you in that area will fully appreciate that my R's drop right from my words. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead, share. Oh, sorry, hold on a second. Let's try that again. Sorry, I promise we just practiced this. Okay. Okay. 
Um, you guys are seeing that big slide, right, Carrie? OK, beautiful. OK, woo. Um, OK, so as I said before, super excited to be here. Um, the work you all are doing is so important, not just in the immediate, but in the long term. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I was a WIC participant with all five of my children, um, starting in Massachusetts and then also in Maine. Um, WIC actually paid for my CLC training, which is um, pretty much why I am where I am today. So your work in WIC is actually affecting people on the very long term. My oldest is 27. So that is when I was first with WIC 27 years ago. All right, let's hop right in. Relactation, the basics. So I want to introduce you to Jess. Um, Jess is actually from Manhattan. She reached out to me through an app called Pump Spotting. I do a little consulting work for them. Um, she was just recovering from COVID. This was this winter. Her baby was about two and a half months old and she had had a full supply and was exclusively, exclusively breastfeeding. Um, so that means she was able to produce about 25 to 30 ounces per day. Post COVID, she was down to pumping just seven to eight ounces total per day max. So she reached out to me hoping to pull her supply back up. Um, she was pretty sad. This is a big deal and um, wasn't really sure sort of where to start. Baby was primarily being bottle fed formula and this was definitely not her plan. Um, success varies here, right? So if we have to really sort of um, think about who we're working with and what, um, where they've started, how far they've been, like how long it's been since they were actually breastfeeding or pumping, um, and then be really realistic with them. So it's, it's not a simple task. It is not easy. It is a huge commitment. Um, and there are definitely a lot of factors in how well it will go. And I would say, you know, in the beginning with a newborn baby, it takes about four to five weeks to establish a true full supply. So we're sort of starting over and it can take even longer when relactating. The closer they are to weaning, the closer they are to when they weaned, the likely they'll be more successful. And it works best for people who have had a full supply in the past because if they never got a full supply, we don't really know if there's other factors sort of involved in why they did or did not have a full supply. <clears throat> okay, so here are the basics, right? So we basically need to remove milk eight times a day with a high quality breast pump. Um, lactation is a demand and supply system. So the stimulation of empty breasts is what tells a body to make more. So because we don't know if a baby can adequately, adequately remove milk at breast once weaned, it's very appropriate in a lot of situations to encourage pumping eight times a day. Um, we, I usually say, everybody does this a little differently, but I usually say about 15 minutes or more, depending on what they're up for, double electric breast pump, um, turned up the vacuum turned up as high as it can go that it is comfortable if it is uncomfortable they need to turn it down they do not get extra milk for hurting themselves um they can also put oh let's talk about breast pumps because not all breast pumps are created equal right so we are lucky enough in maine that our wic program has access to lots and lots of symphony medela symphony pumps which is wonderful i'm not sure how that works across the rest of the country but there are some not so awesome breast pumps on the market and families don't necessarily know what they're getting beforehand. So if families have access to a good quality breast pump, a Symphony is amazing. I love a Spectra, I love a Medela. Um, I won't mention the name brands that I don't love, but there's a few of them that just simply aren't gonna do it. So make sure you know what they're working with. Um, so we're going to encourage these families to pump about eight times a day for at least 15 minutes. I some You will have some moms who will, some families who will want to pump for 30 minutes. I discourage that. They also need to pee and eat and take care of their babies, right? So 15 minutes should do it. And then they can put their baby to breast for what I call recreational breastfeeding. So this is latching a baby with no pressure. Um, 
we're relying on the pump in this situation to sort of do the building of the supply, but it feels really positive to put that baby to breast. Plus it gives baby practice. I encourage this to be a no pressure situation. Lots and lots and lots of skin to skin. Um, they can also introduce an SNS or a supplemental, supplemental nursing system. Most of you are probably familiar with some of these. I'll show you a couple pictures in a little bit. Um, there's a, the Medela one is the one that most people know of. Um, it's actually not my favorite way to do it. They're really expensive. They cost $50 and um, the, the tubing is really flimsy and hard to work with. So I prefer to rig them and I'll show you some options for doing that. Um, the reason I love introducing a supplemental nursing system when trying to relactate is it gives families encouragement and hope because what they'll get to see if all goes as planned is their baby taking a full feeding or a portion of their feeding at the breast. So the basic idea with a supplemental nursing system is that you put the milk that they're taking, whether that's formula or breast milk, into a container you tape a small tube to the to the breast so it kind of pops just below the nipple and then you can latch a baby onto that. So the baby will draw through the feeding tube and get um, their their calories, but also they'll be stimulating the breast and they'll the feeding parent will get to experience that breastfeeding feeling again. Um, again, so I have gu guidelines for families here. Um, with SNSs, um, I encourage them to do it about once a day. Um, if they're super motivated and they love it, they can do it more, but we want it to be a no pressure situation for them and their baby. And then the other thing that I'm a huge fan of while working with this is skin to skin to skin to skin to skin. So we know that skin to skin contact with your baby is one of the very best ways to build a milk supply. I can't encourage this enough. I also think it's good for so many other things, but if we're working to build a supply, this is one of the best ways we can do it. Okay. So tools and strategies. So um, we're, we adapt, you know, there's, it's, this is a very nuanced situation, right? You're, you have to sort of decide where a family's at and where they want to be and how they're going to get there. Um, adapt these ideas to the family you're, families you're working with um, based on their goals. So one of my favorite um, techniques to try is bathing with a baby. So if you have kids, you know that after about Oh, after about the two to three month mark, you can pretty much put any grumpy kid in water and ungrump them. So um, this is one of the most lovely, calming, magical ways to see if a baby will latch. I especially love this for babies who have been bottle fed for a good little chunk of time and are resistant to latching because we just hop in the tub with these babies in a no pressure situation. And they're curious, and a lot of times they actually will latch. It, they don't always know exactly what to do right off the bat, but they often will latch in the bathtub. And again, it's just a lovely way to build oxytocin, to have skin to skin, and to put breasts available without pressure. Um, I'm all about experiments without expectations. This is how I work with families. Let's see what happens if we do this. What if we try this? And I encourage you to use this term with families because it takes the pressure off. Um, like I said before, each family is gonna have a very different method that works to get their babies latching again. So um, here's the little, can you see this little picture of this SNS? So what this is, this is one of the easiest ways to rig a supplemental nursing system. So it's a just a baby bottle with a nipple that we cut um, the top off a little bit. So we're not going to use that nipple for feeding a baby anymore. And then you drop the end of the feeding tube into it and tape the feeding to the other end of the feeding tube to the breast, as you would with any SNS. And the baby will actually draw that. Um, you can also use syringes. I, I put in a resource for some of these things. Families um, can 
can buy a lot of really inexpensive tools um, other than the true SNS that will work really well. Um, so this is one easy way to rig a supplemental nursing system. Um, lactationhub.com is the website that I recommend. They have even like a cap that you can put on any baby bottle that has two um, valves for making a supplemental nursing system. They have the syringes, they have the feeding tubes. Their feeding tubes are actually universal to all the other things that they offer there. And this is just, she's a one woman, woman show. She's a IBCLC who figured out that all of us are struggling to find tools that we need, especially in private practice. And so she put this little company together. So if you're looking for things and she'll send a sample pack out too. Um, I think that relactating is something that CLCs can work with families with as long as we understand that the vast majority of their calories are coming from a bottle while we figure this stuff out. Um, the last tool that I have on this page is <laughs> the infamous nipple shield. I'm sure we all have really mixed feelings about nipple shields. Um, they're not ideal, but this is often a way we can get babies back to breast because it feels familiar to them. They um, are used to firm stimulation in the back of their mouth from a bottle nipple. And so this mimics that. And the goal is to get rid of it eventually. But again, the idea here is that we get this baby to breast and the feeding parent feels hopeful and sees the potential. Okay. What about herbs and medication? So um, this is a really tricky one. It is definitely out of most of our scopes of practice to recommend herbs. There are medications on the market that you have probably, a lot of you have probably heard of. Um, they're all off label use for increasing lactation, um, for augmenting lactation and many of them have some serious side effects with them. So um, not, not a fan and not recommended. But I think herbs are the ones that sort of families have easy access to and they're looking for a quick fix. And there really isn't a quick fix with this. The demand and supply is the way we build a milk supply. So we pump, we put a baby to breast, that is the way it's going to happen. If you have a family who is using herbs um, or is basically going to use herbs, I encourage risk reduction here. So um, galactagogues is what we call uh, foods and herbs that will build, um, help build milk. So they can start with foods. This is an easy one and WIC is all about the food. So um, flax, oats, chickpeas, hummus, almonds, these are all good galactagogues that are easy and healthy um, and they have access to. So um, that is something that's easy to recommend. If you have a family who really wants to take herbs uh, and we're working on risk reduction, um, I have strong feelings that they be fenugreek free. Um, fenugreek has been used for a really long time. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. There are some um, contraindications to fenugreek, including high blood pressure and thyroid concerns. And so that really should be monitored by a physician. Um, and I'm I think it's just one that I would love to take off the table for average people. Um, and then I put reputable brand. And again, like it's out of our scope of practice to recommend herbs, but I also, <sighs> have nervousness about families out there trying to mix their own herbal supplements. So there are reputable brands. Um, there is not a ton of evidence for this. Not There's not a lot of work in studying specific herbs and how they um, work with building milk. Um, but the one brand that I'm that I I like what they're up to, to some degree is legendary. Um, my one complaint with this company is that they will actually, some of their packaging says that it increases the nutritional value of breast milk. And I have, <clears throat> I have feelings about that, um, that claim. So remember, this is out of our scope. We basically, what I'm saying here is that if you've got a family who's using herbs 
on their own, encourage them to talk to their primary care physician, encourage them to do the foods. And then, you know, like if we have to steer them in the direction of appropriate herbs, they should not be just mixing things from the health food store. Okay. So my best pumping tricks. So these are the things that I think can make some of the biggest differences with families who are trying to increase their volume. The frustrating thing here is, you know, if you have a family who weaned two weeks ago, they're going to have great, and they had a full supply, they're going to have great success. It should happen pretty rapidly for them. If you have a family who weaned two months ago, and had a full supply, there's a decent chance that they will build a full supply again. But in the beginning, there's a whole lot of pumping without seeing any results. And that can feel really frustrating to families. Um, so here are my best tricks to sort of increase volume qu more quickly. So power pumping, something that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, the basic concept of power pumping is that you um, are mimicking cluster feeding of an infant. So cluster feeding is when these babies just eat and eat and eat and they can boost your supply. We know babies cluster feed on night two. This is how they bring milk in. So power pumping is meant to mimic that idea. So there's all different ways to do it. None of them are right or wrong. I usually say like real simple 10 minutes on, five minutes off, 10 minutes on, five minutes off for about an hour of time. Um, they wanna just leave their pump on them. So hands-free pumping bra, make sure these families have hands-free pumping bras, um, they can make them. So 10 minutes on, five minutes off for about an hour. I encourage families to reward themselves if they are power pumping. So a great television show they wanna watch, a podcast they're super excited about, um, pumping for most people is not really the most enjoyable thing in the world. So it's a means to an end. So using this time to do something you want can make a huge difference in how it's sort of viewed. Um, they can also do, so power pumps once a day, and that can replace one of the eight pump sessions a day. I love a power pump in the morning. Um, again, everybody has different opinions about when. The reason I love a power pump in the morning is because uh, typically your supply is highest in the early, early morning. So if you put a power pump in there, you might see a little more volume than you see for the rest of your day. And again, that can be really encouraging. Um, they can also do mini power pumps. So what a mini power pump looks like is in a regular pump session, 10 minutes on, two minutes off, 10 minutes on. So just a little break in between can help potentially cause another letdown, boost the supply a little bit, and also mimic cluster feeding to long-term build the volume. Um, another favorite trick is breast massage. And I think everybody thinks of the little circles, right? I use a different technique. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. I call it, it's called pet the cat. So imagine that you're petting a cat, so really gently, right? So if you put your hands on the top and bottom of your breast and gently stroke outward, so top and bottom, side and side, top and bottom, side and side, about 10 times each, what we're doing here is increasing oxytocin with touch, right? So about 10 times each, and then a forward-leaning uh, braless shimmy. And what that does is it helps bring all the milk forward with gravity, right? So when you shake the breast, it just pulls milk forward and can make a difference in volume. And then the next one is the biggest one, and this is hands-on pumping. So hands-on pumping is starting to gain more popularity, I think because it's, there's a lot of it on the internet, there's a lot of talk of it in social media. Um, but this is the idea, and actually one of the, I think in your resources, you have the Stanford University. If not, I can send it to you. So Stanford University put out an awesome hands-on pumping video. 
And basically the idea is that while you're pumping, you're also compressing breast tissues, uh, particularly at the chest wall where the milk likes to hide. Um, and it's statistically proven to increase volume by up to 40%. That is huge. So um, I really encourage you to watch that Stanford University video. You can literally Google Stanford University hands on pumping and you'll find it. And um, they also have an awesome hand expression video uh, that we use a lot. So hands on pumping is magic, absolute magic. They're not going to be able to do it every single time they pump. So sometimes they need to eat and pump. Sometimes they're, you know, dealing with babies and pumping. Um, but this hands on pumping technique, even a few times a day can truly increase volume pretty rapidly. So imagine pumping and just sort of squeezing and then rotating like a clock and squeezing again. And I always tell families focus in like the armpit area. And if you've ever breastfed a baby, you know exactly what I mean. There's like always these lumps that show up in the armpit. So armpit area underneath the front, like underneath the breast is where the pumps have a harder time removing milk from. Um, and what we're doing, so you're draining those ducts at the chest wall really well, and it's doing a few things. It's telling the body to make more, right? Every time we drain a breast really well and then continue to stimulate an empty breast, we are telling a body more. So um, it's emptying the breast really well. It can actually reduce the risk of clogged ducts, which can reduce the risk of mastitis. So this is a tool that anybody pumping, I'm sure you are all seeing as we are more and more exclusive pumpers. This is a tool that can make a huge difference for exclusive pumpers, especially if they're using one of those not so awesome breast pumps that are out there. So power pumping, pet the cat, forward leaning shimmy. Oh, covering bottles, that's the one I forgot to mention. This one seems silly, but I have to tell you that I have had, there's no evidence for this, right? I have had the most amazing responses from clients about covering their bottles. So I tell them to put a little baby sock on their bottles and cover them and set a timer and don't look at them. What's happening when you're staring at your bottles while you're pumping is you're increasing adrenaline. You're nervous. You're like, how much am I going to get? Why is it taking so long? So you're you're boosting your anxiety and your adrenaline is going up. And what adrenaline pushes down is oxytocin. And oxytocin and prolactin are, you know, they work together. They're the primary hormones in making milk. And if we are constantly pumping with all of that adrenaline, it can stop your milk from coming out and prevent you from draining really well. And so again, like we're, it's going to push us back. So cover those bottles, cover those bottles cover those bottles. Okay. So um, here are some of the resources. The La Leche League has a great method. It's called like drip drop or drip drip drop method. And this is, there's a great video of it on their website. And it's basically the idea that you latch a baby and then drip a stream of milk from the top down and the babies will sort of start to get a little bit of that milk while they're nursing. Um, I suspect it's very messy, but I also think it's another easy, no equipment needed way to put a baby to breast and, and see and feel successful. So um, support is a huge piece of this puzzle. There are ups and downs, right? There are going to be days for these families where they're like, yeah, this feels good. I'm making progress. And then the very next day, you're going to get a call of like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too much work. I got less milk today than I did yesterday. And the what I have found to be the most beneficial to these families is just like a really non-judgmental support. Like any milk, any breast milk that a baby gets is beneficial. Any breast milk that a baby gets is beneficial. So I think reminding them that they're doing, you know, really good work and that they don't have to do it 
they don't have to do it. Um, but that you're there for them. Sometimes they just need a pep talk, you know? Um, it's normal for milk supply to fluctuate. They're paying really close attention. It's very normal for volume to fluctuate throughout the day. So as I mentioned before, your volume tends to be the highest early in the morning and the lowest in the evening, which is a really poor design because babies like to cluster feed in the evening. But that is normal. That is normal. It's also normal for it to vary pump to pump and day to day. Babies don't eat, babies who are breastfed do not eat exactly the same amount at every single feeding. Sometimes you want macaroni and cheese, sometimes you want a granola bar, and babies are exactly the same. Um, and remember, this is a huge commitment. There's gonna be ups and downs. Um, you can be a huge support for these people and also help take some of the pressure off of them. Um, I have seen really great success with this. I have also had families who just needed me to tell them that they don't need to do it. And I think that that is another great way to support a family of, you know, they've tried for a couple weeks and they are done. Um, you know, it, it can take a long time. And there's, for a lot of people, if it's been a long time, there's a good chance they're not gonna have a full supply. And I think it's important to sort of let them know up front. Um, and then I also want to mention when to refer out. So as I said, I think this is something that CLCs can work with families with because we know that the majority, we're going to still make sure that babies are getting their primary calories um, until we can maybe do a weighted feed or watch uh, at breastfeeding once, you know, families are getting some volume and make sure a baby is having those one-to-one -one suck swallow bursts. Um, but I think it's appropriate to refer out to an IBCLC. I mean, pretty much any time you want to. But um, if you're having a family who's doing this and baby's going to breast more and is struggling with weight gain, um, I think that's a really good reason to refer out. Um, and if you just are, you know, if you have any concerns that it's not going exactly as planned, and you all can also reach out to us. So as a hospital lactation consultant, I love when WIC peer counselors and WIC CLCs and WIC even IBCLCs reach out for pointers and um, help and questions being answered. Okay, so that's the basics of um, inducing relactation. I mean, inducing lactation. No, it isn't. It's relactating different um, i'm curious if anybody has any questions you are more than welcome to unmute yourself i'm going to see if i can give back control here um, do find me on instagram um, i have a quite a series of reels there that absolutely horrify my teenage children so if you want to have a good time and just imagine my boys being totally horrified that their mother is on TikTok and making reels please Please come see me. All right, how do I give you back control here? The same, if you click the up arrow, or actually it should be an up. X now next to the, where it should say, there you go. There we go. Uh, Paula, we do have a question in the chat. Um, what is your TikTok handle? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's at main mother and company. There's, I think my, my profile picture should be me. Great. I love, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> what else, what other questions can I answer for all of you? That's a lot of information. Is anyone working with families that are trying to relactate or have worked with families? Uh, I can see the chat box now. Yay. Um, I did send most of the resources to Carrie. I think the one that I didn't send, what was the one I just mentioned that I didn't send? Uh, so I put in the chat the CDC resource that you send, the, sent the La Leche League, uh, the Kelly Mom, and also the Lactation Hub. Awesome. Oh, so Stanford, Stanford University was the other one that I mentioned. Um, that one you can easily Google. 
Yeah, so this says, um, I had one recent mom, but she's no longer trying. This happens a lot. And, you know, like they need permission to stop sometimes. It is, think about trying to take care of a baby, pumping eight times a day, figuring out all these magical ways to put baby to breast, and their baby is thriving on formula, right? I think this recall has put people into a tailspin. I know all of you have been, you know, running around trying to help these families um, relactate an adoptive mom who breastfed years ago. So yes, and these, those people can take months a lot of times because they know that there's a baby coming down the road and um, they can also, uh, there's some medication that they can use if they're monitored, like being monitored by a primary care. Um, what was the other question I saw here? It looks like someone's interested. Um, have you ever relaxed an adoptive mom who breastfed years ago? Yes, that's what I was just saying is they they usually have a long period, a longer period of time to work with. They're not it's not as frantic and desperate as trying to get milk for your baby right now. Um, and I think, again, a lot of those families understand that they're likely not going to have a full supply, but that they can. Um, and, and dry nursing is beneficial. I have worked with couples who, you know, one mom is a birthing parent and she's breastfeeding the baby and the other mom dry nurses the baby for comfort in between. Um, there's, oh, there, it's, it's a lot more than just food. The longest space of time between the last breastfeed and relactation that you've worked with. So me personally, I did a six month stretch um, as far as like one-on-one -on -one working really closely with. She never did get to the 25 to 30 ounces a day. Um, she had had a full supply. She never got that full supply back, but I think she got, I, I think she got to like the 18 to 20 ounce mark and then she just kind of plateaued. Um, Moringa. So yeah, so Moringa is the herb that I do like. Um, I'm, it's not that I'm not a fan of herbs. It's just that you have to be careful not to get yourself into trouble with that. It's even out of my scope to recommend herbs. So um, Shadavari and Moringa are the two that I've seen really great success with. I had a mom who had had a breast reduction and um, was having a hard time making a full supply and the Moringa and the Shadavari pushed her into a full supply. You know, the other thing that is there's no medical evidence for, but I have seen a really weird and interesting anecdotal evidence for is those darn, darn body armor drinks. I think it's probably just coconut water, right? I think it's really good hydration. And because they taste pretty good, um, people are willing to do that. I think women particularly tend to be chronically dehydrated. Moms aren't, you know, we're not really great at always taking good care of ourselves. I know since I've had to wear a mask all day at work, I don't drink nearly as much water as I used to. Um, so I suspect that's what that is. Uh, they also have like 200 calories in them. So um, how families feel about that. But hydration can be pivotal in breastfeeding families. Yeah, that's working one a few months ago. Yeah, I lost my mouse. Here it is. <laughs> seeing production. So it's funny because I think a lot of times um, it was a long time. Yeah. And, and again, I sometimes I think they just need to know that they did everything they could do. I see this a lot as a labor doula too. Like, let's do all the things that we can do so that you know you did all the things that you <laughs> that are available to you and can go into, you know, plan B with the understanding that you literally did everything. Um, so coconut water is actually, um, it's a natural electrolyte. That's why. Um, so like, you know, Gatorade would work probably in a pinch. Yeah, so um, I also I was going to say that sometimes it's so interesting that sometimes when people give up, like they're like, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. It's like the next pump session. Their volume's like, bloop. <laughs> and I think it's stress. I think it's stress where people are putting so much pressure on themselves. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think breastfeeding's hard, you guys. This idea that it's rainbows and unicorns, like, it's not. It's hard work. And after you have a baby, you are exhausted and overwhelmed. And you just want your baby to eat. And we still, as good of a job as we're doing, there still isn't enough support for postpartum families. Hypnosis. Ooh, that's interesting. I mean, I think I do talk a lot about sort of... Um, you know, when you're pumping. So some people want to look at pictures of their baby and that helps. Some people that doesn't help. Anything that builds oxytocin, which includes deep relaxation, right? But also comedy is another really good oxytocin boosting trick for people who have a hard time letting down. Um, I love like a little Ali Wong and some headphones. She's hilarious. Headphones though, because vulgarly inappropriate. Um, what else? That's a really an interesting idea. I think we set up monster failure if we tell them all the puppy dogs. And the, yeah, well, I could talk to you about that all day long. I don't, I agree. I, I, there's not a right way to feed a baby. There's not a right way to feed a baby. Um, it's hard. And I don't think there's, I think we spend so much time focusing on prepping for birth. We forget to prep for baby. Um, and even teaching a breast, I teach prenatal breastfeeding classes every month. It's all theory, right? It's like they don't have that baby with them. And um, yeah, it's it's complicated for sure. Birth weight. Oh, man. I'll tell you what, Lauren, I got big ideas. It says I get lots of questions on how to get baby back to birth weight for a mom who is exclusively breastfeeding. Um, don't let them sleep through the night. So I tell people, if you get to the two week mark and your baby is up to birth weight, typically the pediatricians will give you the okay to stop waking them up. So if you tell them that at the beginning, it's like a goal to meet. Um, breast compression, breast compression, breast compression, breast compression. So as a mom of five, I didn't have all day to feed my babies and I found out that breast compression was like the fastest way to like get on with the rest of my day and can help really effectively drain breast, just like hands on pumping. Um, there's no ounce markings on breasts or babies' bellies. Still, how cool would that be? Any other questions I can answer for you all? Started using Reglan. Mm. Not production a few days after leaving the hospital, but has now noticed a decrease. Yeah. So Reglan's one of the medications, um, and it's off-label use, and um, it's that's tricky. You know, I think I think it's natural when you come off any medication or herb to kind of see a slight backslide, right? But then can likely she has the capacity to make that milk. So if she is willing to put a little bit more time in, I think she will likely get back to where she was. Um, also, I like to remind families that if they had low supply, which is, I say it like this because a lot of times low supply isn't low supply, um, that consecutive babies, they will likely make more than they did before. Um, yes, you guys, this was so fun. I would do this every week. Um, if anybody else comes up with questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can DM me on um, Instagram. You can find me at mainmother.com. Um, I'm really happy to give any tips and tricks and help as much as I can. I think I owe WIC a little bit based on sort of where I am. Um, it was lovely to see all of your faces. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paula. And we we truly appreciate uh, the, the timely and uh, incredibly helpful information that you provided us today, not just to you know, Maine WIC, but it seems like, judging by the chat, WIC throughout the, the country. So thank you for uh, the presentation and for all that you do. Uh, if anyone is interested in re-watching this presentation later, or if you have colleagues or coworkers that were unable to attend, you can find a recording of this presentation as well as the question and answer portion on um, our YouTube page for Main WIC uh, that will be uploaded as soon as we are able to upload it. Um, and thank you for your engagement, your attendance, and the, the fantastic questions. 
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Paula. Great, great presentation. <laughs>